the time being, um, 702, we'll call the select meeting for August 4th uh, into session. Uh, let me read this notice. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order concerning imposition on strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. Meetings in the town of Oxford are being conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access, access the proceedings as provided for in this order. And the first item on our agenda is a uh, public hearing for the uh, license transfer for uh, 732 uh, Express. I would uh, entertain a motion to go in to open the public hearing. I would make that motion. Uh, second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Uh, let's call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. We are now in public hearing on on the liquor license transfer. Let me read the uh, information. The uh, public notice. Uh, 732 Express Beer Wine Convenience doing business as the DCB Group LLC of. 1259 Hyde Park Avenue, Suite 123, Hyde Park, Mass, 02136, has applied to the Arsenal Board of Selectmen to transfer the wine and malt package store liquor license of BD Gupta Corporation doing business at 732 Express, 732 Main Street, Oxford, North Oxford, Mass, 01537. Anita M. Kupta, manager to 732 Express Beer and Wine Convenience, doing business as the TCB Group LLC, Shane C. Dixon, manager. This license is exercised at 732 Main Street, Ox North Oxford, Mass, 01537, on the following described premises. A unit 20 feet by 70 feet and a strip mall consisting of one floor located on the easterly side of Route 12 in North Oxford. Beer will be held in uh, seven to eight double door coolers and wine will be stored on approximately six shelves. Bathroom facilities are located in the rear of the store. There is one front and one back exit. A public hearing will be held before the Board of Selectmen regarding this matter on Tuesday, August 4th, 2020 at 7 p.m. And we have received all the uh, paperwork. Applicant, uh, who is the applicant? Hi, that would be uh, Sharnay Dixon and Stephanie Holmes. All right. Okay. And um, you you are going to be the new manager? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Um, all right, board members, do we have any uh, concerns or comments for Shani? Are the store always the same, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Shani, could you tell us that? Yes, we plan to keep uh, things as they are. So everything will be as existing we'll run as, as it is running today. Thank you. All right, so we'll have the same store Thank hours. You. Yes, John, so we'll have the same store hours. So basically it's just a change in the person that's in charge, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Ownership remains the same, just change of manager. No, no, ownership as well. So we'll be taking over ownership and management. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Question. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Cheryl. Thanks. Um, so I, the only concern that I have is that 
um, the ownership and the management have been transferred to individuals um, out of the area in terms of, uh, obviously you, you're, you're from the Boston area. And I just want to make sure that, um, that, you know, if, if the town or anyone like that is able, they need to get in touch with you, that you would be responsive and um, get back to us as needed as, as soon as possible. Yes, definitely. I myself will be working the store as well. Um, so I'll be there multiple times throughout the week. Okay, excellent. So if you see a, a, a 508, 987 number, you'll pick it up. <laughs> that would be fan. That would be fantastic. And um, is is um, if 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 uh, if there's a fire or if the police need to reach you, is there anyone local to the area who has access to the building or no? It would just be yourself and the landlord. Uh, no, also management as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have a, a manager who lives fairly close in Worcester. Okay, perfect. Then I'm all set. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you. Anyone else on the board? Mr. Chair, hi, May. Yes. Um, just also just while I welcome you to town and I welcome you to do business, also just understand the importance of checking ID. Um, we are very strict in town regarding that, and I'm sure it goes without saying, but it, it, sometimes we do have issues in town um, with these licenses, so I just want to make sure that you really, truly are diligent in checking all appropriate IDs at all times. Absolutely, absolutely. We share that same uh, testament. Right. This is a public hearing. Uh, is there anybody from the public that uh, wants to talk in regards to this? Do not hear nobody. So um, that being done, I would uh, entertain a motion to, uh, to grant the uh, the approval of this application as written and forward it to the ABCC for review. I'd make that motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments, concerns? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. You are approved, and we thank you for coming towards us uh, and forward in front of us this evening and wish you all the luck. And um, again, thank you. And at this point, I'll entertain a motion to leave the uh, public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. We have closed this public hearing. And again, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank, thank you. Good evening. Thank Great you. evening, everyone. All right. Next item on our agenda is a uh, purple hat proclamation. Uh, <laughs> So, this year the proclamation, the uh, Purple Heart recipient is being given to Ron DeSantis. Mr. Santez cannot be with us this evening, uh, so we will mail this in, but I would like to read this uh, proclamation into the record. Whereas the people of the town of Oxford, Mass., have great admiration and the utmost gratitude for all the men and women who have selflessly served their country in this community, in the armed forces, and whereas veterans have paid a high price for freedom by leaving their families and communities and placing themselves in arms way for the good of all, and whereas the contributions and sacrifices of the men and women from Oxford who served in the armed forces 
have been vital in maintaining the freedom and way of life enjoyed by our citizens. And whereas many men and women in uniform have given their lives while serving in the armed forces. And whereas our community has a proud tradition of military service and many of our citizens have earned the Purple Heart Medal as a result of being wounded while engaged in combat with an enemy force, which is construed as a singularly meritorious act of essential service. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the Oxford Board of Selectmen, do hereby proclaim August 7th, year 2020, as Purple Heart Day in the town of Oxford, Mass., honoring the service and sacrifice of our nations and townsmen and women in uniform that were wounded or killed by the enemy while serving to protect the freedom enjoyed by all Americans. And this is given under our oath on the fourth day of August in this year, 2020, and signed by the entire board and our town manager. And we congratulate Mr. Santez for this great honor. Is there anyone on the board that would like to say something? Not hearing or seeing anybody, then give that, mail that out to Mr. DeSantis. Again, thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda is a license agreement discussion for. Yes, on here because the uh, town manager is uh, she had to open up the emergency uh, call service at the police station because of all the trees. Down. Let me see what I can go through here. This is, uh, I guess, somebody looking for right away, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, oh, I apologize. I'm so sorry. Mr. DeSantis was on and now he's gone. So I apologize. Oh, he was. He was oh. here for a brief second, I guess. Sorry about oh. that. Oh, that's, I wish he had said something because the note I had said that he couldn't make it. Um, so that's why I went right through that, Cheryl. Oh, uh, sure. No, no, no. I, he just popped in and then he's he's not there. So I apologize. I no, not there. No. No, thank you. Uh, next time, don't be afraid to interrupt me. You know, I, I'm not perfect by any means. So, uh, um, okay. So basically, what they're trying to do is uh, see if the board would be uh, at all interested in granting a license agreement uh, prior to them drafting one and going through all the work. Um, so we received that paperwork, and I hope all of had time to look at it. It looks like they need probably access to their piece of property, um, which is off of Forest Street. Um, that's by way of town land. Um, so there is nobody here in regards uh, to this. Is it? Uh, yes. Uh, it looks like um, Mr. Eichmann is is on. If and it looked like he was the one that was proposing this license or one. Oh yeah, license. Mr. Eichmann, are you there? I am there, but I'm not proposing it. I'm down town council. I'm suggesting it as a, a temporary solution. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, are you, are you recommending that we kind of uh, go forward with this and look look at this further? Uh, looking at it further is fine, Mr. Chairman. I wouldn't say I recommend it. It's really up to the board uh, whether they want to grant this permission or not. Um, okay. Essentially, a license is a permission slip, as you know, that can be revoked by the board at any time. And if it would be given here, it would the idea would be to allow this person to use a piece of town land to access his property from Forest Street 
while he attempted to work out the, the difficulties with his title and try to obtain a permanent right to do that. Okay. All right. Great. Board members, comments? Mr. Chair, I had a question. Yes. Um, so can try Triano, if we do not grant this license, does that mean the individual does not have access to their property? Uh, Mr. Chairman, John, I can yes. get through you. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. The answer to that lies in the title to this person's property that would be investigated by his counsel. His counsel to this point has told me he hasn't found good evidence that he has access, a legal right of access to the property from Forest Street, otherwise than across town land. But, uh, you know, it's, someone has gotten to that property for many years to live in that property prior to this time. Now, whether that was all illegal or whether there's some legal right that's in the title that they haven't found, I don't know. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, John. Uh, may I yes. suggest, it's, it appears as though there's some research that has to be done on this. Could we give them permission for a designated period of time so that this doesn't go on indefinitely, maybe give like 30 or 60 days of permission. And then after that, we would hope that we would have this resolved and we could get more information, legal information on both sides, whether or not um, things are gonna change. Yes, Mr. Chairman, through you, yes, you absolutely could do that. 30 to 60 days, yes. you can put any term you want on a license. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest we do this for 60 days. That would seem to be sufficient time for whatever uh, legal action has to be taken by this individual. All right, is that a motion? I would so move. We second. have a second? We have a second. Do we have any other comment in regards to this? Seeing none, then I will call for a vote. Yes. I abstain. Yes. Yes. And I'll vote yes. That's four in affirmative, one abstention. So they'll have 60 days to uh, do their research and investigation and get back to us. Mr. Right Chairman, time. may I? Yeah, may, Mr. Chairman, may I ask one thing? Typically, we would put this license in written form and have the board execute it. Do you want me to draft an appropriate license for your use? Yes, I think is that okay. Uh, okay. Yes, I I think John, you in agreement? Yes, I that? agree. Okay. All right. Yes, please, John. I will do it. Thank you very right. much. Very good. Thank you. Um. Okay. So let's go to. Uh, since the time is only 20 past, why don't we go to select, uh, Selectman's Pamela. Why don't I do that? Hi. You are here for what? Uh, to get the um, permanent uh, alteration to our alcohol license. To okay. The, uh, pavilion yeah. for Singletary Right and Gun Club. All right, great. Well, I'm going to have to wait on that because that is a public hearing. So um, I just wanted to make sure I didn't have somebody else here I was missing. Um, all right, so why don't we go to Selectman's request because the town manager isn't available at this point. Uh, and I do not, I, uh, I don't know, is, uh, yeah, so why don't we do that? We'll start with Megan. Evening. Um, I don't really have a whole lot, but it was brought to my attention um, by a couple people that run the Little League that the fire department, the North Fire Department, supported them in one of their games the other night and bought all of the players ice creams for both teams. And they wanted to express their gratitude to the fire department for one watching their game because they thought it was really cool to have firefighters watching them. And then two, thanking them for giving them their, buying ice cream for them on the hot night. So I just wanted to extend my gratitude to the fire department 
through the uh, by way of the little league, but also, you know, I think it was very nice for them to be involved in the community and to be able to be out there watching them. And I think it's, it's a great tribute to the leadership that we have there as well, that um, they're able to get everything that they have to do done during the day so that at night they can support the town groups. Um, And other than that, I just want to say, I hope everyone's staying safe because I know the wind is crazy here. Um, So just be safe and that's all. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Megan. Uh, we'll go to Mike Daniels. Um, I'll make it easy. I, I have nothing this evening. Uh, I may lose power. Right. <laughs> Power's blinking. <laughs> we may lo- we're going to we lose, lose you. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Cheryl. Um. Mr. Chairman, I don't have much, but I could certainly make up a something or tell a long story to get us to like <laughs> 7 30 if you want. Um, you know, we can talk about that. You know, um, I just would like to, uh, you know, obviously it's a little crazy out there right now. I was driving uh, in between meetings and um, there's a lot of trees down. So I thought of the DPW immediately. I want to thank them for always being there. Um, that's a, that's a you know big help to us and a big reassurance to the residents. Um, also, just wanted to um, just um, thank again. You know, I know the schools are going through an awful lot right now and trying to figure out their transitioning. I know that there's some hard hard decisions to be made, um, and I I just want to say that I think good news. I think we got some good news that the state is going to fund. The UGA grant, the UGA monies at the levels of last year. Um, so, you know, I just want to thank um, whoever made that happen. I think that'll that should make all of us feel slightly better about upcoming funding. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Um, okay, so John. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I have one thing and I see it as a, uh, a very important thing and it's, it's my honor to thank our, uh, our town clerk for her many years of service. As you know, she has submitted her resignation and uh, that is gonna become effective in October. Um, Lori has been a very faithful uh, employee in this community and I don't know of any town, man, uh, any town clerk that has the respect and the qualifications to do the job than Lori Kelly. Kelly is very meticulous, very uh, helpful, and she's been doing this for a good many years. And I know that she is greatly going to be missed, not only by town government, but by the people that she represents within the community. I wish her well in her retirement, and um, I look forward to um, participating in uh, the appointment of a new town clerk. As you know, the appointment is by by the manager, subject to the approval of the Board of Selectmen. And I I would like to say that I I think it's going to be very difficult to fill this position. Lori has so many certifications, more than most in the area. She's well respected uh, throughout not only Central Mass, but throughout the state as a premier town clerk. So we are going to have a difficult time filling that position. And uh, I just hope that we take our time and we make sure that we get the right individual and one that could do half as much and be half as qualified and half as friendly and courteous as Lori Kelly has been to us and to the residents of this community. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Here, 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 here. Yes, I, I don't. I don't think uh, any of us could uh, say any more, John. Uh, that is uh, very well placed. Uh, I know the whole board uh, is in agreement, even though you know various members in 
state it right out. We all, I know, as a board, regret seeing Laurie having, you know, taking her retirement. Um, she is. She's so good at what she does and has been so good. Um, it's going to be a tough one to fill. You are correct. So thank you for that. Uh, the only other thing I had is um, I had a resident that got in touch with me. They, um, they have their three little grandchildren, um, two from their daughter and one from their son. And the, um, the DPW must have been working in their neighborhood or something. I didn't get the whole story involved. This, uh, this resident also, they have a town business. So I'm not sure if it was at, the, at their business or what, but somehow the DPW um, noticed them playing. It might've been, uh, now that I think of it, it might've been at the town common. And uh, the DPW workers went over and gave these uh, three little children little trucks to uh, to take home and play with them, actually. So, um, you know, just talking like Cheryl was about DPW, how great they are. That's another example where, you know, out of the kindness of their hearts, these uh, individuals from our DPW gave these children a little little gift and they were so excited so the uh the, the resident wanted me to just pass along a thank you to them so that's it's it's again it's just uh like many of us have said it's a credit to the people we have working in this town we are very blessed very blessed all right so that's uh selectman's request we'll go the time being 7 30 we'll go into a bump public hearing for alterations at uh, Singletary Run and Gun. I will read the uh, public notice into the record. Uh, Pamela Wunsch, manager of Singletary Run and Gun Club Incorporated, located at 300 Sutton Ave in Oxford, Mass, applied to the Board of Selectmen for an alteration of premises concerning the all alcohol pouring liquor license. The alteration request is to add their pavilion and the outdoor space between the pavilion and existing premises to their liquor license. The total addition is 5,616 5, square feet. A public hearing will be held before the Board of Selectmen regarding this matter on Tuesday, August 4th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. So with that, I would then also request Request a uh, motion to, to open this public hearing. I would make that motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. This public hearing is open. So, with that, since I already was introduced to Pamela, uh, Kind of give it up to you to kind of explain a little bit what you're doing there. So we want to uh, include the pavilion as part of our licensure to help, especially now with the times that we're in, to have our members be able to socially distance themselves, uh, to have the space to spread out, and also to relax. You know, when when they get off work, to be able to sit outside by our beautiful pond and, um, you know, have a snack and uh, sit out there and enjoy, um, you know, sharing stories together. Uh, it's a beautiful location and, and I just think it would add to our property. All right, board members, comments, concerns, questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, Ms. Wench, will this, will the pavilion area, will it be open year round or will it be seasonal? Um, no, I think we would keep it open year round. Okay. And, and just so that I'm clear, um, we need to approve this, Mr. Chairman, because they will be serving alcohol out there and our, the prior license was just for the inside, correct? Correct. Does that sound, is that fine? okay. Yep. All right. Um, I'm, okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, John. If I may. Um, yes. The, I hope that um, 
everyone understands, um, I'm talking about the, the applicants, that once we approve it, if we do, it has to go to the ABCC because it's a change of premises, they have to also approve it. And this doesn't happen like overnight. Uh, we just went through a similar situation with Oxford's and they did um, get permission to do the outside because of the COVID-19, they fell under those rules, but they've also applied for change of, of uh, uh, alteration to their license, which has to be approved by the ABCC. And we don't know how long that will take, especially now with, with government being uh, tied up with this COVID-19. So I, I just wanna make sure that the applicant is aware that just because we approve it, it doesn't become effective right away. We have to wait for ABC approval. Yes, I'm aware. I did speak with the ABCC directly and he told me the processes. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. Yes, I am. Thank you. Any other question, board members? All right, I, I have the pavilion. This is going to be like a, uh, a tent or something like that, or? No, it's uh -huh. a, a, wood, a wooden structure. It has a wooden roof. Oh, okay. Cool. And it has cement for the base. Yeah. Now the the ground areas where you're showing um, other tables and stuff that will be outside exposed to the elements. Well, currently the tables are all beneath the pavilion, but to okay. socially distance them, I would place them as I drew them in the oh. picture. For okay. COVID. All right. Cool. All right. Any uh, no other questions, concerns? Then I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the alteration of Singletary Rod and Gun Club as presented in this application and forward this to the ABCC. I'd make that motion. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Then I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. You are approved. You can forward that to the ABCC. And we thank you for your explanation tonight. Thank you for having me. All right. And good luck. Good luck. Thank you. So I would entertain a motion to leave the public hearing. Make I second that motion. Okay, I have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in affirmative. This hearing is closed. Very good. Thank you again. All right. We're still a little early. Is the superintendent here? Hello. No. Mr. Chairman, I do see, do I see someone from Aquarion here? Is Steve Olson here? Oh. I know they're at eight. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, why don't we do that? Uh, okay. Mr. Olson, would, would you uh, care to, to give us an update at this point? Yes, um, would you like me to share my screen? I have a presentation. I'm not sure if you have the handout. Uh, no, I don't have anything, but yeah, I don't can, have you, a can you do that? Okay, I will do that. Okay, can everyone see the, uh, the presentation screen? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thanks for having me. I know it's early. Um, I don't think that's an issue. If uh, you're ready to go, we'll get going. Yep. So wanted to give you an update um, for anyone new there and just kind of give a quick overview of our water system just so you can see it uh, on paper, what it looks like. I want to review our 2020 capital improvements and then go over some operational highlights and planning and then just touch base on what we're doing for the community. So our water system. Um, this is just a system description. It's kind of like a box diagram. We have four wells, uh, three on North Main Street, uh, one, one A and two, and then Nelson number three off Nelson Street. 
Uh, all of the wells are treated um, at different chemical addition facilities. We use chlorine for disinfection. We use potassium hydroxide for pH adjustment. We use phosphate for corrosion control, and we add fluoride for fluoridation. Uh, so the water from the wells is treated and pumped into our distribution system, which is a network of interconnecting pipes. Uh, we have three water storage tanks and a booster station off Sutton Ave that pumps into Joe Jenny Road. Uh, distribution network is made up of 41 miles of pipe, uh, 607 valves, 198 fire hydrants, and approximately 2,628 water services. Um, this is a, a map of our distribution system. You can see it kind of, it goes along mostly along Main Street, also down Sutton, Sutton Ave. Um, and it's a basically a north-south system. If you look real close, you can see different colored lines. Those represent different sizes of pipes. Um, pipe sizes vary from less than six inches to up to 16 inches in diameter. Um, also shown, we're calling out the storage tanks. Uh, the Nelson Street well is down to the south, um, and the North Main Street wells are up uh, about three quarters of the way up the page. So basically, that's our distribution system network of pipes. So for capital projects, um, if you've been on the board for a little while, you've heard us talk about the manganese issue at the North Main Street well field. Um, we are looking at uh, two different ways to uh, address that issue. The first is uh, a new source. And we did some test drilling in 2019 at two sites. We've identified one site. Uh, we're trying to do another site this year. Um, we identified two sites, we're down to one. Uh, we're trying to get access to it because it's private property. We are looking to get an access agreement or an easement in order to go on to that property and uh, do some test drilling and see if we can find some well, uh, some water. Um, we're also looking into uh, drilling a satellite well at the site of the Nelson Street well. And that well would be um, just in case anything happens to our existing well. It would uh, not increase um, our production, but it would be uh, a safety factor in case we have a mechanical issue or some other issue with the Nelson Street well. So that's our new source. Um, uh, option. The other option, of course, we have is treatment. So we could put a small treatment system in at the North Main Street well site uh, below. On the bottom of the page, I have a little schematic diagram of what it would look like. Um, it's just a, a little blow up of the access driveway, some of the piping we'd have to do. You can see the existing well building. And we basically have to shoehorn it in at that site. It's a really tight site. Um, so the next phase would be to do a full conceptual design and do a good detailed cost estimate so we can figure out um, the uh, capital improvements needed. So no matter which way we go, whether it's a new source or treatment, you know, we're talking uh, multiple millions of dollars, you know, two to three to $4 million for, for that project. So it's quite a significant investment. And uh, that's why it's, uh, we're evaluating options over the course of a couple of years here, just to make sure we get it right. Um, some other capital improvements, uh, just this year, uh, the spring, we installed a new pump at Nelson well number three. Um, it's a larger pump. It can pump uh, over a million gallons per day. Um, and that was put in, in May and it's working great. Um, we also wrapped up the design of a, a water main replacement project on Church Street. There's about a thousand feet of um, transite pipe which is uh, its AC pipe. And we're, we're planning to replace that pipe with ductile iron. Uh, CLDI is cement line ductile iron. The design is complete and we're targeting uh, fall construction. Um, we're also planning to rehabilitate the Prospect Hill tank. Uh, there's a picture of that shown on the bottom of the page. Uh, we're planning to design the improvements this year and have construction completed next year, 2021. Uh, and also off to the right, the lower right hand corner, you can see the section of Church Street that we're targeting to replace the water main. Um, some operational notes. Uh, many of you know it's been a fairly dry spring and summer. Uh, so I have here some precipitation data um, for the past five years, also 2020. 
uh, 2020 is the column on the right. And just some statistics uh, for the months of May through July was 6.91 inches below average. That's in total precipitation. Um, year to date through July. So if you look at all the precipitation from January through the end of July, uh, and we look at an average over the last five or 10 years, we're about 6.73 inches below average. Uh, and then just July 2020, uh, the month standing by itself, we're about 2.77 inches below average. So if you look at the, very, uh, the different years, you can see that 2020 in July matches closely with 2016. And if you recall, 2016 was a drought. So it's been very dry. Um, and it's just important to note, note that and just try to conserve water where possible. So as far as production, um, we are keeping up with demands. Um, we have a registered limit of 0.78 million gallons per day. Um, our average production is about 0.635. So we have a little bit of buffer for new development and growth. And this is um, cumulative monthly production um, for, the, for the year. And you can see in July, um, it's, it's about average. Uh, we were fairly low January through April and May, and then June and July, <clears throat> we really saw an uptick in production. That's shown a little bit better on this, this next graph, which is just um, the monthly production. So for every month of the year, um, it's how much we produce in that one month. And you can see that in the winter, you know, in January, February, March, we don't pump much water. Spring comes along, spring and summer, we pump more water. And then in the fall, it, it tails off again. So if you focus on June and July, um, you can see that those months uh, were really elevated compared to other years. Whereas January through March, um, those months in 2020 were a lot lower. So we've seen a, a quite a significant uptick uh, since May. And actually most water systems have seen uh, really large increases in their average demands um, this summer. And uh, most water systems are uh, accounting for that. Based on COVID-19, you know, most people are home. Um, they're working from home. They did a lot of landscaping in the spring. Um, you know, they're home and, and they're seeing their lawn and seeing things and things that they wouldn't normally see during the workday and, and they're watering and using a lot more water than normal. Um, so I guess the, the point being is that uh, it is a, a, a drought period. Uh, we are keeping up with demands, but uh, you know, anything our customers can do to conserve water uh, would be beneficial. Um, system operations. So uh, we are working hard to continue to provide this essential utility, uh, drinking water. Um, and we obviously are continuing operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we did some flushing in the spring and that's to prevent discoloration in the system. So uh, to keep the water clean um, in the distribution system. We did a leak detection survey also in the spring. Uh, we found two leaking hydrants. So that was actually fairly good. We have a, a tight system. So that means that we're not wasting water, which is good. Uh, we did a lot of, we did our regular hydrant maintenance in the spring. Uh, we're planning to replace a fire hydrant and coordinate that hydrant with the fire department. Uh, we are doing our valve maintenance, which is basically uh, identifying the valves, making sure they're accessible, we can get on them. Uh, they're not paved over so that when we need them, we can find them and use them. Uh, we've tested all our large customer meters and our source water meters to make sure they're accurate. So when we're pumping and reporting usage and consumption, we want to make sure that we have the numbers right. So we test those meters annually. That was completed in the spring. Um, we're also doing our backflow testing. Um, so backflow devices are there to prevent um, cross-contamination from businesses and other water services. It's a very important part of our water quality and protection program. Uh, that work was suspended for about a month, maybe six weeks um, as the COVID pandemic uh, was evolving. 
we developed um, protocols and, and safety procedures for getting into businesses and safely testing those devices so that our staff is protected, but also we want to protect all our customers from any um, possible contamination threats uh, in businesses. So, um, and we've suspended, we're still suspended uh, some work uh, that requires going into customers' homes um, at this time. We will go into home if there's an emergency and they have no water, but um, unless there's an emergency and they have no water, we're basically uh, trying to resolve issues on the phone and without entering a home. Um, so that's our operational and planning update. And just a few notes on uh, what we've been up to the past uh, several months this year. Uh, we've made over $3,000 in donations to several uh, community organizations, um, recreational athletic leagues, the Barton Center for Diabetes, and the Town Center Beautification Program. Um, I think everyone's aware we do have a custom conservation program where we ask for our customers to volunteer to have their toilets, uh, shower heads, and faucet aerators replaced with energy efficient uh, conservation uh, devices. And we also have a, um, a closing, clothes uh, washer machine rebate program. So if you buy um, a high efficiency um, clothes washer, you can get a rebate uh, for that. So to date, uh, we've done over th done about 30 toilets, 29 shower heads, 20 faucet aerators, uh, five washer rebates. Uh, 28 customers have participated. Uh, we've spent, we, we collect fees for new services. And with those fees, uh, it's, it's there to uh, fund this program. So those fees are not uh, for anything else but funding this conservation program. Uh, we've saved about a thousand gallons per day, which is great news. And we have about 25 customers on the waiting list. So if anyone knows, um, uh, any other customers that want to participate, uh, they can call our phone number or there's also, they can go to our website. There's a way to um, log into our website and, and volunteer for that program. Um, and we are targeting to do a, uh, again, a fire hydrant replacement uh, in Oxford with, with the fire chief. So I think that's all I had for an update. And I welcome any questions um, for any of the board or anyone else. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Members, any, uh, any uh, questions or comments? No. I have a question. Okay. Yep. Yes. This is uh, Joel Douse, uh, Six Patton Street, Oxford. Yep. Yes. I I apologize. Uh, I just got onto the meeting, so I, I don't know if I missed anything, uh, and I can't see the minutes from the last meeting and I forget the date escapes me right now, but uh, we were supposed to have a dangerous dog hearing uh, meeting at I believe 8.30 PM on that date. And I understand why it ended up getting changed. Um, but I believe if I'm not mistaken, I was told that during that meeting, uh, Chairman LaMarche had mentioned that that hearing would then be rescheduled for tonight. And then we finally received notification that it was now not going to be heard until August 18th. I was just wondering why it looks like the minutes for the, tonight's meeting weren't published until after that last meeting. Is, is there any reason why it wasn't heard tonight? Yes, because um, when, even though the minutes aren't, aren't published, I mean, the uh, agenda isn't published, we do have uh, many things that are on the agenda that we already put there prior and I am not always privy to that information, uh, you know, at our meetings. So um, I have to uh, say apologize because I, I thought we would be able to fit it tonight, but with everything else uh, on the agenda, we weren't able to get that done. Okay. I just, just sorry. I, I know I spoke with Luckman Lamarche uh, the other day. I, I didn't receive any word back from her. She was going to look into some things, but uh, we're just trying to figure out what in the meantime is keeping our family safe. This incident occurred back in, uh, I think it was May 29th. And it feels like we just keep, keep getting pushed aside. 
we almost had a pretty severe incident happen. I'm just trying to figure out when something's actually going to be done or at least be heard so that we can take the next corrective steps. Well, it's definitely scheduled for our next meeting. Um, and in the meantime, we're, our animal control officer, Kelly, is staying quite, uh, quite in the loop on trying to keep you as safe as possible in the meantime. That's all I can say. Um, you know, th there are, res like I said, we, there's just so much we can do on, on various meeting nights. Um, and unfortunately that, that, got, that got pushed off because of the, uh, the residents uh, family issue. So, um, you know. Well, I understand, I, I found that out after the fact. I mean, I, I was waiting to be let into the meeting earlier than in, than the scheduled time and there was nobody there to let me in or explain to me what was going on i didn't find out till after the fact okay um yeah that was again that was something that occurred very quickly it was it, i got notice like i think an hour before our meeting that it wasn't going to yeah. occur so well, I, um, I understand that but but when i when when i've received notification in the mail from your board for an 8 30 appointment or meeting and I'm there at 825 and there's nobody there. Somebody should be there to let me know what's going on. So I'm not wasting my time. Okay. We'll see if we can do better in the future. That's all I can say, sir. I'm sorry. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. all right. Board members, any comments for Steve? Not seeing or hearing any. I thank you, Steve, for coming and giving us an update. Thank you for all you do for the town and the uh, people, the residents that uh, have access to the uh, aquarium water and um, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Thank you, Cassie. All right. Now seeing our superintendent of schools, uh, if you'd like to, uh, oh, Take you on there, <laughs> uh, Dr. Nash. Your microphone isn't on. I do that right now. Here. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to try to give you a, and first of all, um, thanks to the town manager for inviting me to give you a 500 foot view of uh, what school schooling may look like uh, this coming fall. So I'll begin with uh, just, a, just a brief uh, statement. Uh, this has been probably the uh, most incredible uh, three, four months that I've ever seen, certainly since we all uh, uh, were part of, of course, um, a virus that um, has devastated this country and as a result certainly has impacted everybody's lives and has changed the way we do our business. And certainly um, that change has come uh, full force to education. And so I um, cautiously and carefully say to everybody that uh, what education was and what we uh, knew it to be, uh, is not gonna be the same for quite a while. And so I'll begin with uh, giving you a little bit of background. Uh, the end of June, actually June 25th, we received uh, superintendent's initial guidance from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And that guidance um, told us that their goal was to bring back as many students as possible in the fall to in-person learning, but with a set of safety requirements. And those safety requirements included the following. One, uh, a mandate that all students, uh, for in-person learning to occur, all students in grades two through 12, as well as all adults would be wearing masks. Two, uh, physical distancing guidelines were provided to us. And those physical distancing guidelines said that the medical research that they had used to make determinations as to how to safely return students and staff to schools included uh, a minimum amount of distance between uh, students and between adults. 
And that minimum amount of distance was three feet from edge of seat to edge of seat with the aim of distance for six feet. Another uh, mandate or another uh, safety regulation was uh, hand washing, either hand washing frequently and or sanitizing multiple times a day by both adults and also by students. And the fourth area that they talked about for in-person, any type of in-person learning was to ensure that frequently touched areas, what we call high touch areas, would be cleaned multiple times a day. With those four guidelines in place, school districts were asked to go out and conduct what, what they called space feasibility studies to see how many students you could fit in a classroom based on these new guidelines, distancing guidelines. First, the minimum of three feet distance with the aim for six feet. We did our um, space feasibility study in the early weeks of July where the business manager and I visited every building and literally um, took measurements with principals to see indeed whether or not we could uh, bring back all of our students and staff and what would that look like. I provided a report and a recommendation to the school committee on at its 720 meeting. And my recommendation was that we should not uh, bring our students and staff back with the minimum space of three feet that I felt that we should aim for what the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, recognized and encouraged at, at six feet. And that if we were to do that, we would not be able to bring back 100% capacity of all of our students. The school committee uh, voted that evening and uh, agreed that this was not um, the best uh, model three feet distance. And as a result of that, uh, we have had to develop uh, a, uh, what we call a hybrid uh, option for our students for this fall. Now along those lines, when the guidance came out from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they indicated the school districts needed to, pre needed to prepare three models of learning. One in person with the new safety requirements, i.e. the mask, the physical distancing, the hand washing, and the frequent cleaning of high touched surfaces. Two, a hybrid model, which is really a blend of in-person learning and remote learning, except your capacity for students is cut in half. And three, what we call a total remote model, similar to what uh, we recognize we did last spring, but a little bit different. When we uh, made the decision as the school committee that the minimum three feet was not what we wanted to aim for, that meant that we had two options left for the fall. One was hybrid and the other option is remote learning. We recognize that, that this is a parent decision to send their children back to school. We recognize that there are uh, families out there who have medical issues within the family, that we have students who are medically compromised. And we also recognize that there are parents who quite frankly feel that it's just not safe, no matter what we do in schools, uh, to send their children back. So to that end, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, I'll be presenting to the school committee uh, the two options uh, for schooling for this fall, one being a hybrid option uh, and the other being remote learning. Parents will have the ability to make a choice as to which option they prefer. When we talk about uh, hybrid learning, there are a variety of schemas or models that we could use. And what we determined was the model that we would be using, or at least we'll be proposing to the school committee tomorrow evening, is what we call a week on, week off model, where students would be physically, half of our student body, call it cohort groups, would physically be in school for in-person learning for Monday through Thursday. The other half would be in remote learning for, the, for that period of time. The teacher would be planning for both, but have half of her class or his class in front of them at any given time. And the other model a remote is really more self-directed. It's a model that will allow um, our families and, and our students to uh, participate in a more comfortable model if they feel that they should not be in school. We'll use uh, distance learning platforms 
we anticipate uh, having uh, to hire remote learning supervisors uh, who will be assisting, working with, monitoring, uh, having conversations with students who are participating in remote learning. A couple of things about the school year that you should be aware of. The commissioner agreed to a shot in the school year for students. Uh, the school year for students is 180 days, uh, 990 hours for secondary students and 900 hours for elementary. That has been shortened to 170 days for students, 935 hours for secondary and 850 hours uh, for elementary. That means that the opening of school will be later um, than typically uh, we have seen it in the past. Primarily, uh, the additional days up front, uh, 10 minimum, will be used by our staff for all of the preparations and training that need to happen. I can tell you that there is not a single thing that has remained the same about schools. Schedules have changed in every building. Part of our proposal for our elementary school children is that we start the day an hour later so that our teachers can teach a lesson to those students who are in remote learning for that week. I know that that's going to be very difficult for parents, but there was no other way for us to provide an opportunity on a daily basis for our elementary teachers to connect with the very youngest students. Our high school schedule has changed from a seven day period to a, a block schedule, four periods a day, what we call an orange black block every other day. Uh, that limits mobility, which is one of the key factors that DESE has recommended we do to keep students in cohort groups and to minimize mobility of students. Our middle school schedule has changed from a six period day to a five period day. There will be no lockers. Our transportation has changed. The requirements regarding transportation now limit us to uh, a bus with 71 students, we now can fill at 32% capacity with a um, seating plan that I call zigzag or alternating seats with all students on buses wearing masks, with students sanitizing be, uh, when they arrive on a bus, when they leave a bus, and with us having to hire bus monitors to ensure that all of this uh, happens uh, the way that we need to make it happen. Our lunches will be served in classrooms. Our arrivals and dismissals will be different. Our pickups and drop-offs will be different. Our school calendar will change. Recess will look different. We're not sure about sports and clubs. There are additional guidelines for, uh, for performance-based courses. Uh, any courses where there are respiration, like music, dance, PE, Chorus band have to be outside, uh, chorus and band with 10 feet distance. Uh, it is logistically um, a work in progress with respect to all of the guidelines. We have no idea whether we will have fall sports. Those guidelines will be coming out. Uh, we have done some things already, certainly many things, but one of the things that we have done is to certainly increase, and we did this last spring, when we moved to remote learning for all students, we immediately provided to any parent and any student who needed it, a Chromebook. As you are aware, all of our students in grades eight through 12, uh, we have a one-on-one -on -one model with them. We do not have that model, or we did not have that model with our grades uh, under grade eight. However, we determined that uh, we needed to provide all of our parents, all of our students with a device. And we were able to do that by dismantling our carts that we had, our mobile carts. And we have gone forward um, so that this fall, instead of simply asking people if they would like a Chromebook, we are going to mandate that all students in K through 12 have the same device. So it will be easier for us should we have to move to remote learning either in a building or in the district or if the state would shut us down again. We've had to also um, recognize the need for additional staffing. To that end, 
we are hiring four custodians, 10 or 11 bus monitors, uh, four remote learning supervisors, and up to 20 safety and health monitors. Now you may ask, where does that funding come from? We've received, as all school districts have received, um, additional funds for COVID related costs. And we anticipate that the key areas for us in those costs will be staffing, technology, transportation, PPE equipment, personal protective equipment, and certainly um, some of our other cost related areas uh, around uh, cleaning buildings and uh, sanitizing and those types of things. We uh, are at a point now where we are probably uh, at a limit with the amount of money um, from both grants. Those grants total uh, combined $720,000. Uh, one is what we call the ESER money and the other is CARES money. And uh, we have uh, tried to uh, reserve most of that uh, for our staffing needs, our PPE equipment, our technology, uh, and we are unaware yet of what our transportation cost will look like. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not able to do that until our cohort groups are developed. So we have to <coughs> redesign our transportation system as we know it. It will change because students will, won't be coming to school every day. It will sim simply be half of our student body uh, during a week. So while one uh, group is in school, the other group is home. So until we develop those cohort groups, we really won't know what the entire cost will be of transportation. We will be doing surveys next week of our parents, uh, one to indicate and find out from them whether or not they are going to um, take transportation or whether they will be driving their students. Uh, yeah, I could go on uh, and talk to you, but I'd rather just uh, have you ask me questions, anything specific about any of the areas. Certainly the health and safety protocols are spelled out for us. We received additional documents from DESE um, that include uh, transportation, facilities and operations, remote learning, and our latest one is on additional course guidance. So we are continually receiving uh, those updates uh, telling us what we need to do. Uh, it's not an easy task. <laughs> there isn't an area of education as we know it that isn't gonna look different, uh, no, no matter what. Nothing will look the same. And it, logistically, it takes a lot of work, uh, a lot of time, and a lot of effort by a lot of people. Uh, we uh, have work through uh, our parents in surveys, our staff in surveys. Uh, we had eight uh, subcommittees that dealt with health, transportation, special needs, uh, communication, teaching and learning. Uh, all of those uh, committees and their information, health and safety, uh, filtered into us in making this decision. But the number one priority for me and for the school committee was the health and safety. And based on the health and safety, of our students and staff, we did not believe that using three feet as distance was something that we would endorse. This committee would endorse, nor would I recommend. So that is the reason why uh, we cannot bring all students back for in-person learning as we begin the year. I would also say that we acknowledge that our special population, uh, students uh, with special needs, particularly those in substantially separate programs, our ELL students, as well as our integrated preschool students, they will be on a different schedule. Uh, we will be bringing them back uh, every day, uh, Monday through Thursday. So they will not be on a week on week off. We are very uh, concerned about the most vulnerable populations, including our high risk students academically. Uh, but at, at this point in time, we have had some plans in place this summer. We'll continue to have some things during the school year for them. Uh, to engage in, certainly. Uh, and as we determine additional needs for those students, we may very well change their schedule and put them to uh, a week on, week on schedule instead of a week on, week off. So uh, if this is a fluid document, evolving, 
And all of this, quite frankly, uh, could be a little bit different. I'd like to just close by just talking about what our opening of our school year is going to look like. I was very concerned that uh, doing all of this would mean that on a given day, we would just uh, turn the key and everything could would be all right. And that we would certainly think that we could just step in and we would know how to do all of these things, that we would know how everything was going to operate, um, that we would have all of the logistics ironed out perfectly. Uh, that certainly didn't work in the state of Massachusetts because the state of Massachusetts is where it is because it used a very thoughtful, phased in approach to reopening the state. And along the way, after every phase, it stopped and paused to see how it was going. And I guess my question is, why wouldn't we want to do the very same thing for our students and our faculty? So to that end, uh, we are not, we are opening school on September 16th. That is our proposed opening date. Our staff and faculty will have 11 days prior to the school year to prepare, to train, to plan, to design lessons differently than they've ever designed them before. And then we will do a phased in orientation for our students and staff those three days. The plan is to bring them in, to, sh to especially young students, but even students at secondary level, so that they can see and understand how these changes impact them. From passing time that's staggered, to hallways that are directional one way, to recess where you can't go out and be with whoever you want to be with. So it's important for us to phase that in. We intend to do that. And then we intend, our plan is to open with remote learning for every, every student who is uh, electing a hybrid model through the end of September. We wanna stop and assess. We wanna see what's going on. We wanna get a good handle on remote learning because it is not gonna be the same type of remote learning that we had last spring. The requirements are different from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Last spring, I think the concerns that parents had may have been the length of time that students were really uh, in school and also the fact that they were not graded. Both of those were things that came from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. But this fall is different. Uh, the commissioner has called it a robust model and it certainly is because the expectation is that whether you are in a hybrid model with remote learning or whether you elect remote learning, uh, and simply intend not to come to school at all for any in-person, that your school day parallels the regular school day, whatever that day looks like. The length of time parallels that. And also, all students will be graded. And that those two are major differences. So to that end, we wanna make sure that we do two things. We wanna assess and see what's gonna happen with the medical data as we start to bring people back what we are, and what's happening in the state and in communities around us who may have different models. And we want to also be able to make sure that we do remote learning well, because while I would like to think that we'll probably be in school for in-person hybrid and eventually all return, reality may very well be that we're gonna to have to flip the switch again in 48 hours and all of us are gonna to have to be in remote. We wanna make sure that that's a more robust um, viable model for all of our students. And that's one of the reasons why we're gonna open the school year with remote. If things go well, then we will begin uh, the month of October and phase in a hybrid model. So I just wanted to uh, give you that information. So I'll stop there, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, entertain any questions that anybody might have. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nash. All I can say is wow. <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable. Board members, do we have questions or comments, concerns? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Cheryl. Um, if I may, through you uh, to Dr. Nash. So uh, Dr. Nash, we, I know this is your um, second tour of duty here mm -hmm. in Oxford. And I, I certainly remember when you came here the first time and I remember that your resume was quite long and lengthy and very experienced. And I would just like to say that while I'm sure you may have second thoughts, 
of um, participating in this type of new educational environment. I wanna say that I'm personally grateful that you're here and we have your leadership to help us through this. And I think that it's, it's a challenge, not only is schooling going to be a challenge in the fall, but I think it's going to be a challenge for parents to adjust. And um, we've had this type of schooling um, system for years and years and years. And it's been one of the things that has never changed. So parents worked daycare around it. They worked mm -hmm. work around it. They worked um, you know, taking care of other family members and so forth. And I, and I hear some of that frustration with um, you know, some of the parents and the residents in the community. I think that it behooves us as leaders in the community to, to, to make a personal decision as to whether or not we, we support what's happening and what's going on with Dr. Nash and the school department and you know, convey to as many people as we can that we're simply just trying to do the best we can with the both safety, with safety and, and um, for both our students and also our um, faculty. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I will take a, a, you know, a leadership position in the community and saying that we're doing the best we can with what we can and we're all just gonna have to be a little flexible as much as possible. And I just would like to say that if you need anything um, from myself, I'm more than happy to be of some help if I can. But what I need is sleep. <laughs> To tell you. That's what I need. I can, right about I can send a pillow. <laughs> so. You know, let me let me say this. I, I think every school district across the state is struggling uh, with how to best provide. And they and the balancing act is on one hand, there isn't an educator or a parent who doesn't believe that their children should be in school and they should be in school full time because there is no substitute for a teacher in front of a group of students. Um, th that is the reality, and I think that's what many parents will tell you when they try to work from home and also become a teacher at the same time. I think the recognition of the work that uh, our staff does, our, our educators do on a daily basis was probably never more appreciated than when we shut down school from March uh, to June. Having said that, you know, the balancing act for me is always gonna be around uh, priorities around the safety, the well-being of staff and students. And I recognize that no model no model is going to make anyone happy until we get back to full in-person learning for 100% of our students. And the reality is right now, um, that is not a safe model, uh, in my opinion. It is not a safe model, as you will see around the state. There are very few school districts, in fact, I would probably venture to say um, less than 10%, who will be aiming to bring back all of their students 100% uh, unless they, they have extraordinary space in classrooms. Uh, many districts are, are using a variety of models and that in and of itself can be a, a challenge, particularly when uh, you have a staff member who lives in another town and whose children attend that school district and teach uh, in our town are employed um, as, a, as a staff member in a support capacity. So we not only have the challenge of trying to figure out what model is gonna work for us, but we also have the challenge that some of our employees who live in other towns uh, will have uh, their family members, their children, attending a school with a very different model, uh, whether it's a hybrid model, days on, days off, or whether it's total remote learning. So we're struggling with trying to figure out how can we accommodate that, what can we do, uh, how do we um, provide some, some time, if you will, uh, for our um, staff members, maybe uh, a little differently. So those are just some of the staffing issues, but I do recognize that this model, when uh, parents uh, will understand it, uh, they probably won't like it. I would certainly uh, understand that also, but also recognize that um, it is really about safety and well-being of their children, that the decision was made this way. All right, thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Cheryl. Mr. Chairman, can I, I'm sorry, I'm fine, I'm yes. fine joined the meeting, I apologize. Um, Dr. Nash, I just want to say thank you for coming on. One of the reasons she's here 
is because we work very closely in partnership. Um, I appreciate the fact that you're willing at the um, invitation of myself and the uh, chairman of the board to speak with this board before actually and laying out the plan um, in its almost entirety before actually addressing through her school board, um, which she works in close partnership. So I think once again, we've been on the phone with one another um, speaking about this for quite some time. And I wanted this board to also in a tangential way, know what is going on with the school department. And I just wanna thank you for uh, coming before this board, laying things out. I know you have a, a long, strong uh, suit of supporters in the school department. Um, you certainly have that across the community. Um, I wanted to give you another opportunity uh, before another public audience, um, because we know people um, have difficulty struggling with trying to get communications out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that, um, Dr. Nash, and I appreciate the fact that, um, you know, you've taken a very strong professional cooperative relationship uh, with the management of the town as well. Thank you. And if I could just put one plug in, uh, the uh, draft uh, reentry plan blueprint will go out to all of our parents and staff tomorrow. Uh, for those who cannot attend next week, we're doing a planning to do two um, remote meetings, Q and A's, one for our parents and one for our staff. We'll get those dates out. But also there's a feedback form on the blueprint, blueprint feedback form for anyone who can attend either one of those meetings um, to complete. And that will come out with a link tomorrow when they get the blueprint document so that if they want to respond to some of the, the questions and give us some input, they can do that. We have a very quick turnaround, unfortunately. This document is due to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on next Monday. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that uh, it um, doesn't uh, need to be edited. But I would also add to the community that this is a very fluid document and that components of this document still need to be negotiated with our union. So while we are proposing this, this model and what it looks like needs to be negotiated with, with my union. So that's another catch all. But I also would like to thank some town department people that I met with um, in putting all of this together. Uh, Tom Purcell, uh, I had a meeting with him and uh, Kerry Singer, I believe, who is the chairperson of the Board of Health uh, was in remote and we talked about some of the health issues initially talking with them preliminarily about the thought of hybrid learning and getting some information from them so that they understood why we were doing that. And I, they were extremely helpful in that meeting, gave us some extremely uh, beneficial uh, comments and feedback. So I wanted to thank them. Also uh, last week we met with Mike Lupus. I think he's a member of one of uh, the committees that my business manager heads up, probably is the facilities and operation. And as late as this afternoon, I was meeting with Steve P um, to go over HVAC systems and understand those better and all of the work that um, has been done in the schools. And I have to tell you, um, I was extremely um, happy to hear the amount of work that has taken place over the last probably three or four months in every one of our schools with respect to our HVAC systems, repairing them, upgrading them, changing filters, dampers, so that we now have our 20% um, flow of air that uh, Desi is uh, asking us um, or re requesting that we do. So I just wanna shout out to them because they went above and beyond. They really just came whenever we needed to see them. And uh, I can't tell you how appreciative I am uh, and certainly um, having the opportunity to kind of throw things off of the town manager every now and then um, also makes makes it a little bit easier. So I just thank all of you. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Nash. Uh, board members, any more comments, concerns? All right, well, we thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Nash. We wish you a lot of luck. Um, Thanks. You know, it, you think of the children first and then you got to think about the faculty, um, not necessarily second, but in the same realm of that. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite, quite a difficult task you people have ahead of you and I wish you all the luck. Thank you, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for coming in tonight. All right, that brings us to our manager's report. Uh, town manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize for not being um, in the totality of the meeting. I do appreciate um, you being in the dark. Um, there are a lot of citizens right now across Oxford that are in the dark. We did set up our emergency operations center and um, in getting uh, the direct calls. And I can tell you, um, you know, uh, being there that we are fielding really literally, it's been uh, more than um, a couple dozen calls uh, where we've had lines um, down, you know, uh, trees down on houses, people trapped, um, no casualties right now, but um, certainly many potential scenarios um, that need to be addressed uh, for the health and um, safety and well-being of the citizens. So I know everybody's working and as soon as I'm done with my report, I'll be back down there. Uh, we just didn't necessarily think it was going to be as bad with the tree damage, but it, it's been substantial. So the first um, item on the uh, manager's report is setting the special town meeting. I can't believe that I'm actually saying that because we just had a annual town meeting, but I would need this board um, to know that the town clerk and the town moderator um, have both uh, contacted and we have um, been in discussion about uh, allowing this board to take a vote to set the fall town meeting for October 7th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at the Oxford High School. I'd entertain a motion to approve the uh, special town meeting for Wednesday, October 7th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Make that motion. Second. Motion and second, comments? Call for a vote. Yes. 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 John? Yes. And I'll vote yes. That's five in affirmative. We'll set the town meeting for that date. Thank you. Next item uh, relates to the fall town meeting is the opening of the special town meeting warrant. Um, I would like to request that the board vote to open the warrant um, on August 5th uh, for the town meeting. Entertain, I would entertain a motion to set the uh, opening of the town warrant for the special town meeting for August 5th. Make that motion. I second the motion. I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in affirmative. We will open the warrant tomorrow. And the next item is the closing of the special town uh, meeting warrant. I'd like to suggest that the board uh, vote this evening to uh, set the date of September 1st, 2020 at 4.30 p.m. for the closing of the warrant for submission of warrant articles. I'd entertain a motion to close the warrant on September 1st, 2020 at 4.30 p.m. I'll make that motion. Second. And I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Fire and affirmative. We will close it on that date. The next item has to do with the state primary warrant. Um, the town clerk has requested the board vote this evening to sign the state primary warrant for September 1st, 2020 um, election. The voting will take place from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Chafee Elementary School in Oxford Middle School. I then obtain a motion that the board vote to sign the state primary warrant uh, for September 1st, 2020. Make that motion. Second. A motion and a second, call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in affirmative, we will sign that warrant. Thank you. The next item has to do with election worker appointments and we'll need many of those. Our town clerk has requested the board to appoint um, the attached list of residents as election workers. I would entertain. Okay. I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the election workers and appoint them as written uh, in uh, paperwork until August 15, 2021. Make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Call for a vote. Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to abstain. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
And I'll vote yes. That's four in the affirmative, one abstention. Uh, those workers are and I'm going to move up an actual item on my manager's report since we're talking so much about um, elections and our town meeting. Uh, late yesterday, I had received word, um, well, actually it was in the morning, but then eventually um, sat down with our town clerk. Okay. Our town clerk has announced and uh, submitted to uh, the chairman, which um, a notice that was uh, shared with the rest of the board that uh, Lori Kelly has alerted us that she uh, will be retiring um, in September after 30 years of service. And, you know, obviously uh, we are all very heartfelt about the fact that um, her uh, tenure here uh, is about to um, end um, in the next several weeks. Obviously our town, town clerk has been very dedicated and she has agreed to work very closely, not only through the uh, September primary, but also in getting whatever we need to get ready for our fall town meeting. Um, I will, I think, un unequivocally state that uh, Lori has been extremely dedicated to the practices and principles of being an exceptional town clerk. Having said that, um, there will be some significant shoes to fill, um, but I know that she wants to spend time uh, with family and with um, friends and uh, finds that this is the right time for her after 30 years of dedicated public service to retire. And we are very grateful for that service and we wish um, Lori well, and she'll work very closely in um, being able to fill those shoes and uh, we'll keep the board informed as we make progress on that front. Um, the next item I wanted to um, alert the board that the Zoning Board of Appeals has requested that Thomas Purcell of 117 Old Webster Road be appointed as a regular member to the Zoning Board of Appeals rather than an alternate. This change actually requires a formal vote of the Board of Selectmen. I'd entertain a motion that Tom Purcell be appointed as a regular member of the Board of Appeals until the annual town election of 2023. Make that motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in affirmative. We will appoint Tom. Perfect. The next item has to do with an application that this board had entertained for the uh, business establishment half baked and fully roasted. It has come to my um, office's attention that the newly licensed restaurant has added evening hours that were not listed on their application materials. And I would just want the board to be aware of that and um, asking the board this evening whether they feel that the um, establishment half baked and fully roasted um, should uh, amend their application materials at this time and we submit them to the board. I'd entertain a motion that we ask half baked and fully roasted to submit uh, amended application materials consistent with their hours of operation. Make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Comments? All for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Fire and affirmative. We will have them amend their application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item has to do with a request that has come through both my office and to the chairman, and it, re it, it relates to the special permit um, that's normally required uh, for animals uh, that goes through this board. Uh, Ms. Rachel Perez has reached out to our chairman uh, about sponsoring an article, having the board sponsor an article for a special town meeting that would remove the requirement for special permits for animals to be issued for, in this particular case, ducks and chickens. Um, she uh, has expressed to the office that she is prepared to submit a warrant article, I think on her behalf, but she feels that this board um, should think about uh, potentially uh, sponsoring an article to that to that um, end. Um, I, I think the chairman of the board wanted uh, the Board of Selectmen um, to be able to uh, consider whether they would uh, move to sponsor um, such an article for the special town meeting. Thank you. And I open it up for discussion to the board. Chairman. Yes, John. Yeah. Um, 
We, we have a uh, special permit process uh, in, our, in our bylaws. Uh, I would like to know before I vote on this, what effect and what duplication there may be between the laws we have on the books as far as a special permitting is concerned as it relates to the proposal that's being presented to us. I would like to know all involved before I vote on it. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just, yes. in, in just addressing that, I think Ms. Perez's attempt is not to change the bylaw for special animal permits, except to create potentially an exemption for ducks and chickens. So that's what I think her, her you know, not having that language um, in place. I think the intention of the board uh, could be that you might be amenable to considering it, but just like any warrant article, the final draft language would be what this board would vote for in putting the final warrant together. So I would encourage the board that until you actually see that language, um, that it would be agreeable to, to think about that. I think it's, um, her contention is that, it, and I think um, my manager's office uh, is that if there is gonna be such an article that's presented, it's best um, potentially for the board to create that language if they so choose and want to do either that or to contest it on the town meeting floor. I'm just relaying the information. It's not that I have a vested interest in it other than wanting to uh, make sure that the board understands that this may be an article that does come up and it's up to the board whether they might wanna um, tweak language on an existing bylaw or not. Mr. Chairman? Personally, yeah. Uh... Oh. Yes, yeah, Cheryl, go ahead. No, go no. right ahead. I'll, I'll jump in after, no big deal. Okay, well, I, I have talked personally to Mrs. Uh, uh, Perez and um, I, am, uh, I am not one to really want to back this particular um, Warren article. Personally, I think we have a bylaw in town that when you have neighbors and you have ducks and chickens or other animals like that, that is the reason we go through the special permit process. Uh, so I, as a member of this board, will not be in favor of, uh, of going along with, uh, with this Warren article. Um, Mr. Go Chairman, ahead, I, no, I, um, I mean, you know, I'm in both of uh, both your camps and um, Selectman Sad's camps. I'd like to, I'd like to understand a little bit more about what Ms. Perez is is doing. Um, and at the same point, I'm not in, I'm not inclined to remove the bylaw. So we have lots of chickens running around. Um, I think that it's a, I think it's a good thing that we keep a little bit of a, of a, of a hand on it. So I, I know that there's a request. Uh, of a motion for the board of selectmen, but I think I'd like to see more of that first so that I, I'm a little clearer what's going on. Mr. Chairman, uh, what I have so far are the emails that have gone back and forth with you that have been placed um, with everyone. Um, if you would like to, you know, not um, consider sponsoring the actual article, I think the resident will do it by petition. And I think that's what she's trying to find out She'll know that she needs um, time to do that because it would be uh, submitted as a citizen's petition if the board um, you know, doesn't want to do it. The only other thing I could do is perhaps have her come before the board to more fully discuss it with you. Um, and that would be you know, subject to the chair's calling if he would like um, the board to you know, ask questions directly to her rather than look at what has been generated through the correspondence. That's just a suggestion if you'd like. Yeah. Like I said, I, I did talk to her and I am aware that if we don't uh, sponsor that she will go to uh, try to get the appropriate signatures and, and get this on the warrant. Um, okay. And personally, I, I think that's the place. If she can get the signatures and draft an article and bring it to the town floor, uh, then we're leaving it up to the people. Um, but again, whatever the board would like to do, we could in this Mr. matter. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, John. I, I totally concur with you on this one. You know, we, 
we have the, these laws on the books and they're on there because we needed them, okay? And it's tied in with zoning and it's tied in with neighbors that may have a legitimate concern. And I think if, if we deviate from what we already have, I think it's gonna be a mistake. Now, if you wanna change the special permitting process, an article to do that, well, then that's a different story. But I agree with you. If they wanna put an article out there, let them go the petition uh, route in order to do it. Uh, you know, our process is pretty good. I know that other towns are having issues with this. I know the town of Dudley is, and I know other towns are having a problem. For some reason, there's a big deal about people having chickens in their backyard and harvesting the eggs and what have you. And it, it's a thing right now, but it can become out of hand. And that's why you need rigid laws in place. And we have that special permitting process. And, and I think it's worked well for us in the past. It's very, very strict, but you know what? It keeps things in perspective here. So I, I agree with you 100%, and, and I'm not willing to deviate at this point. All right, thank you, John. Um, well then, I, at this point, uh, town manager, I think we'll just go back and tell her that uh, the board is uh, Larry of sponsoring at this moment, and mm -hmm. let her go forward with her petition. Okay, I'll convey that um, information to her. Thank you. It has um, to do with the Conservation Commission and in particular Conservation Commission meetings. As you know, um, the board and the manager's office had put forward uh, to have meetings, um, all public meetings done remotely. Uh, our conservation agent, Judy Lochner, has been in touch with me uh, because uh, the Conservation Commission, which tends to have very small meetings, uh, she has uh, informed me that a number of members uh, cannot really do the virtual remote. We've tried a number of times um, working very closely with the members. Um, many of them are not as adept at technology um, and are asking if they may be able to not do remote meetings, but to do it in concurrence with what a Board of Health agent has outlined uh, for a small meeting um, to be held at our Oxford Police Department training room. Um, this is basically being requested because there has been consistent technical difficulties for the members and therefore they've had difficulty actually hosting the meetings. I don't see a problem with it as long as our Board of Health agent has um, met with our health, um, our, excuse me, conservation agent to outline specifically how that meeting has to be laid out and to be conducted. All right. Uh, I, I don't personally see any issue, you know, it's uh, very small attendees and stuff. So I will uh, entertain a motion that we allow the uh, Conservation Commission meetings to be held in person according with accordance to uh, Conservation Agent Judy Lochner's proposal. Make that motion. Second that motion. All right. Do we have any comments? Yes. Yes, John. Yeah, I, I just think that this is a, this is a good thing because, you know, not everyone is adept to the technology that, that faces us these days. And uh, to give them an opportunity to, to conduct their business, I think, is very important. You know, these people volunteer, this committee volunteers, they don't get paid for this. If they're willing to serve and willing to sacrifice to do this job, I say more power to them. And if we can help them, as long as they follow the social distancing and they get the uh, okay from our local Board of Health, I say go for it. And I thank them for wanting to serve. Very well stated, so agreed. Any other comments? Then I'll call for a vote. Megan? Yes, no? Said yes, sorry. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in affirmative. We are more than happy to have that happen. Thank you, town manager. Thank you. The next item has to do with the 
um, out-of-state travel memo um, that has been uh, distributed to all town employees. Uh, it is uh, relative to out-of-state travel and return to work policy. I had a number of department heads that were concerned as we slowly phase in people's uh, work routines where before um, we had, especially our public safety departments, uh, nobody was um, traveling or taking vacations. But as we start to ease into it, uh, one of the things um, we're trying to do is also mirror what the executive orders have been from the state uh, uh, governor's office about prohibiting uh, employees from traveling uh, into areas that are considered listed by CDC as not just hotspots, but deemed to be at higher risk, according to the Mass Department of Public Health. So we have distributed that. Um, the department heads have been uh, pleased with understanding that if anybody chooses or must uh, travel, um, that they would um, be prohibited if they go to one of these hotspots uh, from entering back into the workforce um, with the exception of needing to be quarantined for 14 days. There's more to it um, in the memo, but I wanted to share that with you just so that you know that we're still uh, struggling with the idea that we're going to have to be very careful uh, before we uh, continue to allow employees to develop some semblance of normalcy around not just their work life, but also uh, their relaxation and their benefit time. So uh, that was to lend some clarity to the issue. And uh, we're not alone. There are other communities that have done something similar. Um, so I wanted to share that with the board. Uh, the next, I just um, had some pictures that I wanted to, I know I've been giving you updates about the Oxford Ecumenical Food Shelf. And um, one of the things I wanted you to know is that as I was uh, touring the OCC recently, uh, one of the things that I noticed is they were getting ready for their Thursday distribution. And um, one of the things that I think is very apparent here is that the food shelf has been hard at work um, on a weekly basis, packaging food donations and um, all of these other additional supplies that you can see. Uh, this is an enormous job. Um, and when you talk about doing it through volunteers, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So I thought the public should know that this is the way we're trying to also help um, and the food shelf is a wonderful branch um, of the community to show the spirit of giving and also sacrificing and contributing on a community volunteer basis. So I wanna thank John Neeland, I wanna thank all of the volunteers for taking care of that. Um, this community is very lucky to have that long established relationship that has stepped up during the COVID uh, crisis. And this is not diminishing by the way, uh, the number of people who are still in need and it will continue to play a vital role for us. Uh, the next item has to do with treasure play ground improvements. Um, I also have some uh, photographs that I wanted to uh, share. We had just announced uh, prior to this meeting uh, last week that the, we have the installation of new playground equipment um, and also the DPW has worked very hard at sprucing up um, all of the uh, playground with new uh, ADA compliant engineered wood chips. The um, big slide uh, apparatus there that uh, you can see that's blue and green, uh, that has a triple slide on one side and a big slide on the other side. Uh, this is being done um, through the Smolensky Millet uh, donation that came uh, through requests uh, by our Recreation Commission Chair, uh, Joe Maisley. Uh, the Smolensky Millet uh, Foundation or trust has been very important for us to actually be able to do some of these projects that normally would cost thousands and thousands of dollars um, to make happen. So we're not just doing one, uh, we're doing two of these uh, incredible pieces of equipment. One is um, now being constructed down at Carbuncle Beach. So Smolensky so Millet has been a major player uh, for this community to develop um, true both programs and capital projects for children. And uh, as you know, the splash pad has been a fundamental contribution, but these are two new improvements. And I do wanna give credit to the DPW. We just approved this last uh, spring. Uh, the equipment came in late in the fall. And of course, you know, with the COVID and everything else, um, they're still finding the ability, um, even through this massive heat wave, to not only construct this, which normally, 
um, has on-site engineers, which cost an awful lot to put this equipment together uh, for standards um, to be met for public safety. And uh, fortunately, we have very adept staff that are able to do that. And so that actually saves us money that we would normally have to send out and have on site. Um, and if anybody has ever done these playgrounds and put them together, I have as a volunteer, it's incredible work. So the place is now opened. Um, and uh, I think uh, we wanted to make sure that parents felt comfortable under COVID and we uh, regulations and we uh, provided a wash station and sanitizing hand station there as well. So hopefully this will be good for both visitors and children alike. Uh, the next item also has to do with physical fitness and getting outside. Um, I wanted to acknowledge to this board that recently with the retirement of uh, Stacy Barr, uh, I thought the best fit uh, for uh, stepping into the shoes even during the uh, pandemic uh, was to appoint uh, Shelly Lambert, who's one of our program managers as um, our interim uh, OCC director. Uh, she has uh, hit the ground running in trying to uh, address how we're going to phase in some of the programs. As you know, a lot of that budget was also reduced, uh, but she um, has allowed this board to see um, that this week uh, they are starting outdoor fitness classes. Uh, and in your packets, you'll see that there are going to be uh, PIO basic training, body basics and yoga ladies, uh, along with um, Zumba for kids. Uh, and we're going to do uh, not only outside, but also at Carbuncle Beach. I don't know if Shelly is online with us or not. Um, you'd have to hit your... Um, oh, there you are. Okay, I didn't see. I'm looking down at the telephones. Hi, Shelly. Can you hear? Oh, she's just coming in. I thought um, this would give her an opportunity to address the board about some of the things that she's, um, you know, seeking to have done. Shelly, um, can you hear us? You might need to unmute yourself. I'll wait for her to see. If okay, she I'm here. I do keep getting kicked off. So oh. if you lose me, I'll apologize ahead of time. Oh, that's quite all right. I don't know if you heard, but I had explained how you were starting uh, the fitness programs again outside in a phased in approach and that I had the pleasure of appointing you as interim uh, director at OCC. And maybe you can give them an idea of what you're working on there and um, also uh, give them a little update. My next item is the splash pad. So if you could do that, Shelly, that would be great. I can, thank you. Thank you for inviting me even to do so. Um, yeah, I am very happy to say that we started classes last evening. So Monday evening was our first outdoor class and um, those who showed up had a very good time. They are doing what we asked and pre-registering online and they're coming with their masks on and leaving with their masks on and um, it's been good so far, so we're excited. We are not yet offering our silver sneakers classes to our um, older members. We wanted to see how our current classes go um, and with the heat and humidity, I think it's best to not push our seniors too much at this point in time, but we will return to some type of normal for them very shortly. I'm hoping for September. Um, the only children's programs we're offering at the community center at this point in time will be an outdoor Zumba for kids class that's currently scheduled for Wednesday evenings. Um, our online registration platform has that class also set up for parents to register their children. Um, and I am working with another staff member that I was allowed to bring back to come up with some safe and enjoyable youth programs for later in the year or when our COVID situation makes such programming feasible. Um, we are interested in physically active. Pro Try again. That staff member and I are working on a great clean out of the rooms at the community center. It has kind of become a repository for dead chairs and computers and printers and things like that. So we are working on getting rid of all of that and making some more usable space in the building. Um, and like town manager said, the biggest news we have this week is that we are working on opening the splash pad. 
Um, the DPW has done a great job in getting it ready. And so far, we're scheduled to open it tomorrow at 11 a.m. if the weather allows us to do so. Um, hours will be Wednesday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily, except for Thursdays, where we'll be open until 6.30. Um, we plan to operate at 40% capacity so that we can achieve greater social distance for the children who are in there. The cost will be $5 per child per day. Um, and that's about it. Town manager already touched on the hard work that the Oxford Ecumenical Food Shelf is doing, and I just want to applaud them. Um, my daughter and I volunteered while I was on furlough, and she's going to continue to volunteer on Wednesdays bagging the food. So um, that's been a really great experience, and they are an amazing group of people. So it's, it's really important that they are continuing their work. And that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, um, Shelley. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to also let the board know that um, working with Shelley, uh, we are trying to reach out to any of our part-time employees who had worked at OCC in different capacities, obviously, some with contact, um, physical fitness programs, uh, that we are not allowed to have and we are not uh, prepared to engage in. Uh, but we have um, a number of the former employees who had been furloughed and then also um, let go um, because of the reductions to the budget. And uh, they have agreed to come back and, and help spearhead uh, at least for you know the next um, more than likely two months if this hot weather continues all the way through September for the splash pad. So I'm very grateful that we're able to try to once again, bring some normalcy and also retain some of the people back, um, you know, in a way that uh, gives us hope that we'll be able to once again, uh, you know, commence um, all of our programs that we once had. But I do want to thank you, Shelly, for all of the hard work that I know you're working towards. And um, I know we'll be jump starting the, um, the feasibility study also with OCC now that we have sort of some stability there um, with some new leadership. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, the next item um, on the manager's report is uh, the historic fountain refurbishment. So this is another great indication of uh, DPW working towards beautification uh, with my office and with the DPW director. It's long been in our park, um, that wonderful, big historic fountain and it's large. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, the time has been hard on it, weather has been hard on it. Uh, but as we have been uh, putting in new benches and new um, large uh, uh, pots, flowers and beautifying around our bandstand, uh, Steve Esposito in particular uh, and I had a conversation about wouldn't it be great to actually make this fountain um, work again. Uh, what I did notice is last year when I was working with beautification efforts around the fountain with uh, Joel Maisley and his wife who were part of the uh, beautification committee, we didn't realize that it was actually very unstable and it had rusted um, or it had become um, impaired underneath um, and it actually could have really fallen over. So um, true to the great work of the DPW, I went by one day and the fountain was gone. <laughs> and now it looks like this, if we can get it. And wow. that just beautiful, huh? So, you know, our goal is to get it to be a fountain again. But um, I want to say I saw her driving on the back of the DPW dump truck and I was just so excited. I was I'm coming up the road and I said, I think I see the fountain in front of me and it was just look like this and it just is beautiful. So hats off to our operations manager for uh, spearheading it. And uh, our mechanics actually were fixing some of the underpinnings and uh, you know, have worked very hard on that. And, uh, and the rest of the crew has uh, worked to make it as beautiful as it looks right now. So I'm eager to have it um, actually functioning in the near future. So terrific work. And um, the final, uh, I think, point to end my manager's report in is to uh, notify the board that um, Chief Sad had 
uh, talk to me about uh, a couple of things that recently happened in town. And as you know, we've had um, some tragedies uh, related to uh, accidents and, and involving uh, pedestrians and the like, but you never know what's gonna happen um, in any given day. And so uh, we have had the police chief uh, inform me of a act of heroism that took place here in the center of town um, by a one uh, Jeffrey uh, Silver. And Jeffrey had pulled up to the center of town uh, and was minding his own business, waiting for the traffic light to change. And he happened to look um, to his side and he saw a woman um, in, a, in a vehicle uh, who began to have a seizure. And um, you're going to see this video so that you can see what actually transpired and how someone in a very selfless way noticed someone was in distress and availed himself not only to get out of his vehicle, but to make sure that the woman um, was going to actually come to a resting spot to get emergency care. So um, this took place on July 17th. And I think um, I wanna show it to you because I think at some point we should really um, have Mr. Silver um, completely acknowledged um, and recognized for this. So if we can, I'm not the technology whiz, Tim, take a look at this video. The woman is rolling in her truck, almost gets hit. A truck almost hits her. And this man jumps out of his car, realizing that she's in distress. And he goes in, he opens the door, um, and you'll see it here, and actually puts her brake on. Here she is, here he is, look at this. He's trying to stop her, he's trying to stop the vehicle. And finally he gets in and he hits the emergency brake. Is that not amazing? I don't know if you could all see it, but um, she came so close to being hit by that large Mack truck and other vehicles. And now um, Mr. Silver is trying to flag someone down to call um, 911 and uh, because the woman continued to have a seizure. So he literally saved that woman's life. And um, I think it's just an amazing thing that some of these things happen in, uh, in any given day. And I thought that was such a, uh, a positive thing to end our meeting on. And I would uh, welcome if the board would like to find some fitting way, maybe think about this of how you'd like to recognize Mr. Silver uh, for that act of heroism that took place right here. Um, and thank you to the cameras that we installed because it allowed it to capture it all on video. Um, I'd be open, depending on the board's view, to uh, have Mr. Silver join us at our next meeting where we could probably present him with uh, some sort of uh, proclamation or mm -hmm. uh, something like that in uh, that the board appreciates his uh, quick thinking um, in that action. I don't know what the rest of the board would like to say, or that would be. Here. Go ahead, Megan. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, we live in a day and age where a lot of people won't act. And there's actually studies that have been done that when people see others in danger, most people won't run in to help. So the fact that he did this, I think, speaks volumes about his character. And I absolutely think that it would be right for the board to recognize that. Any, anyone else want to add? Yes, no? Yes. I, yes. I, I agree. I agree with Megan. Uh, I, you know, and you. Right. right. You very seldom see this happen in live video. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> I and, thought if you saw it, you'd see it. Yeah. I mean, I was in awe watching this thing. And wow. God bless this guy for being there and being able to do this. I think it's fantastic. Definitely have men get a proclamation, do whatever we can do, have the chief in uh, or whatever to, to properly recognize this guy's efforts, because I think it was amazing. Great. Yeah, so we'll do that, Madam Chair. We'll uh, okay. set that on our agenda and and get the chief involved, I think, is a great idea, John. Um, so we'll get that under 
uh, in the works for our next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one last thing, and I wasn't here at the beginning of the meeting when you did the proclamation for Purple Heart Week. I know that um, Mr. Labonte may have shown the actual picture of the town hall with the purple light lit up. Um, we're doing the same thing we did for Gold Star um, recognition. You'll see the town hall um, and the bandstand is lit up in purple. Um, I got a call actually um, the other night uh, from uh, Mr. Esposito who showed me um, that it's working out terrific. And if you go by this evening, we instead of just one day, we're gonna have it lit for the whole week because we want people to see it. So both the bandstand, if you go home um, this evening or driving out, uh, and also the town hall is lit up. And um, and I wanna thank uh, both Esposito brothers for making that happen and uh, for recognizing all of our Purple Heart um, veterans. And that's all I have. And then concludes my manager's report. Thank you for indulging in the time with me. Great. No problem. Thank you very much. And we already did our selectman's request. Um, so unless anyone has anything else to add, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I make that motion. I second that motion. And I'll call for a vote. Yes. 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 And I'll vote yes. Five in the affirmative. We are adjourned. Thank you all for dealing with uh, an interesting evening, shall we say. <laughs> all right. May you get electricity back, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Stay safe.